Good evening. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's a miracle, so. Um, I want to thank Father Joseph Paul Alban for our second night of this Lenten reflection. And as he began yesterday, this topic is universal because whether it be our own suffering or the suffering of somebody else that we know, each one of us has to confront and contemplate this reality. And so thank you for being here, and thank you. And I imagine we're going to need our hymnals soon, so I'm going to go get mine. Okay. wearing the fancier microphone tonight, so I hope everyone can, can hear me clearly for the evening. Uh, I've been told my whole life I'm one of the loudest people, so when anyone says they can't hear me, I'm always kind of like shocked, because <laughs> it's my whole life, they're like, could you please quiet down? So I love, a, I love a congregation that's like, could you be louder? I'm like, yeah, I, I can be an incredibly loud. Um, so again, uh, for those of you who weren't here last night, I am Father Joseph Paul Alban. Ooh, there we go. Uh, I am the chaplain at the University of Dallas. I've worked in campus ministry. Uh -oh. Father Garrett, where are you? Um, I've worked in campus ministry for about 10 years, uh, on and off before I entered the order and now for another two and a half years since I've been ordained. So. The great majority of my ministry has been with young people uh, who also struggle and suffer. Uh, we all know that different times in our lives we have a hard time, uh, but I'm very blessed to have that ministry and to do that work. But like we did last night, let's stand up, we'll say a prayer, sing a hymn. Uh, the hymn will be number 438. And we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4, 438. So the prayer, again, is a prayer that we're supposed to say before the crucifix. And so I invite you to just look up to our Lord behind me uh, to just contemplate for a moment the cross. And then we will uh, enter into our evening. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Look down upon me, good and gentle Jesus, while before thy face I humbly kneel and with burning soul pray and beseech thee to fix deep in my heart lively sentiments of faith, hope, and charity, true contrition for my sins and a firm purpose of amendment. While I contemplate with great love and tender pity the five most precious wounds pondering over them within me, and calling to mind the words which David thy prophet said of thee, my Jesus, they have pierced my hands and my feet, they have numbered all my bones. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Christ, when first you came to earth upon a cross, they bound you and marked your saving kingship's worth by thorns with which they ground you. And still our wrongs may fashion now new thorns to pierce that steady brow and robe of sorrow round you. Oh, awesome love which finds no room in life where sin denies you and doomed to death shall bring to doom the power which crucifies you till not a stone be left on stone and then the nation's bright or throne will never more defy you Oh, wounded hands of Jesus 
has built in us your new creation. Our pride is dust, our boasting still, we wait your revelation. O love that triumphs over loss, we bring our hearts before your cross to finish your salvation. Please be seated. If you are a Protestant or a convert and brought a Bible, uh, we are going to be in Matthew 27, verses 32 to 50. Uh, much like last night, we're just going to read through this tonight. It's a little shorter passage. So Matthew 27, 32 to 50, I'll read through three times. Uh, in Lexio, normally the first time is, is meditating, then we eventually move towards prayer. But for tonight, as you listen to this passage, and like I said, I'm going to read it through three times. If something strikes you, sit with that. Uh, again, the, the Word of God is living and effective. I think one of the things that we don't do well as Catholics is spend enough time with the Word of God. The Word of God is of inestimable value. It's deeper than we will ever know. And the more that we live and breathe Scripture, uh, the better our lives will be. One of my favorite images is of St. Augustine. At the end of his life, as, as the you know, barbarians, we can call them, it's more technical than that, but as they were coming to destroy the city, he actually, pious legend says, tore up the Psalms and put them on his wall so that he could sit surrounded by the word of God as he waited for his end. Uh, I think that's an image for how we should live with scripture. We too often just hear it on Sundays and uh, if you're like me, sometimes you tune it out, <laughs> you wake up halfway through the gospel and you're like, oh no. Uh, so tonight, I invite you to just listen carefully to the end of our, our Lord's life, to, to his crucifixion, and just listen to these words, enter into this mystery, and if you want to imagine it, imagine yourself in the scene, or just listen to the words, but however will keep you engaged in the word of God, like I said, I'll read it through three times. As they were going out, they met a Cyrenian named Simon. This man they pressed into service to carry his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they gave Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he had tasted it, he refused to drink. After they had crucified him, they divided his garments by casting lots. And they sat down, and they kept watch over him there. And they placed over his head the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and the other on his left. Those passing by reviled him, shaking their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the son of God and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priest with the scribes and elders mocked him and said, he saved others, he cannot save himself. So he is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now and we will believe in him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. The revolutionaries who were crucified with him also kept abusing him in the same way. From noon onward, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders who heard it said, 
This one is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran to get a sponge. He soaked it in wine and putting it on a reed, gave it to him to drink. But the rest said, wait, let us see if Elijah comes to save him. But Jesus cried out again in a loud voice and gave up his spirit. As they were going out, they met a Cyrenian named Simon. This man they pressed into service to carry his cross. And when they had came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, they gave Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he refused to drink. After they had crucified him, they divided his garments by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And they placed over his head the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and the other on his left. Those passing by reviled him, shaking their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the son of God and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priest with the scribes and elders mocked him and said, he saved others, he cannot save himself. So he is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now and we will believe in him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. The revolutionaries who were crucified with him also kept abusing him in the same way. From noon onward, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders who heard it said, this one is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran to get a sponge. He soaked it in wine and putting it on a reed, gave it to him to drink. But the rest said, wait, let us see if Elijah comes to save him. But Jesus cried out again in a loud voice and gave up his spirit. As they were going out, they met a Cyrenian named Simon. This man they pressed into service to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they gave Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he refused to drink. After they had crucified him, they divided his garments by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And they placed over his head the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and the other on his left. Those passing by reviled him, shaking their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the son of God and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priest with the scribes and elders mocked him and said, he saved others. He cannot save himself. So he is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now and we will believe in him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. The revolutionaries who were crucified with him also kept abusing him in the same way. From noon onward, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. 
And about three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders who heard it said, this one is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran to get a sponge. He soaked it in wine and putting it on a reed, gave it to him to drink. But the rest said, wait, let us see if Elijah comes to save him. But Jesus cried out again in a loud voice and gave up his spirit. I was a deacon about four years ago now, and we were about to have the exaltation of the cross. It was 2019, and I was asked to preach at our house. And I'll be honest, I would rather preach in front of a thousand people more than 20 priests, Uh, because priests are always, they have a lot of opinions. I don't know if you know a lot of priests, Uh, but they're like, oh, you could have done this, you could have done that. And so... I was nervous, and and it was the exaltation of the Holy Cross. And I was like, this is my first time preaching in front of of all these men that I've lived with for years. Like I said, it was a house of about 30. And so I was like, I'm going to get incredibly prepared for this preaching. I'm going to pray more than I ever have because this is going to be, this preaching is going to be excellent. Uh, And I'm really going to, I'm really going to get them. And I sat down in my room, I lit a candle, because if you know, you're Catholic, a candle will help you do anything. Gotta have, a, gotta have a candle lit if you're gonna pray, otherwise God won't look at you. Uh, but I, I lit the candle and I started to pray and I, I put my head down and I started to pray the words, Lord Jesus, teach me everything about the cross. And before I got the thought all the way done, I stopped. I was like, Lord Jesus, teach me everything about the cross. I don't, do I want to know everything about the cross? I was, I was stuck in that moment because I thought, well, teach me enough about the cross that I can preach really well on Thursday. <laughs> you know, I don't know that I want to, I don't know that I want to know everything about the cross. You know, I, I like my creature comforts. I like having a good time. Uh, and it's a theme of my own life, my own relationship with Jesus that, that I truly struggle to contemplate the crucifix. I think all of us, if we're honest, um, love Jesus. You wouldn't be here on a Tuesday night listening to some guy that you don't know if you weren't somehow interested in Jesus, right? But to behold Jesus on the cross is something that I think for most of us as Christians we either get weirdly used to and don't actually think about it, or we just don't think about it at all. This was brought home to me in a very intense way when I was a novice. I thought, you know, I, I, uh, sister back there might understand this, but as a novice, you're really zealous. Like it's when you're like, it's like, it's like when you first start dating, you're in love, everything's great, this is the best thing ever. And I felt like we weren't doing enough to serve the poor. And I was like, I went to my novice master. I was like, with the one hour a week I got on the computer, I found a place in Fort Worth with uh, the CFR, the, the gray Franciscans. They were serving there and I was like, Father, I printed off this stuff. Can I call them and can we please go serve the poor? Uh, And my terrible joke uh, was, uh, in the novitiate, we had a lot of wisdom figures, uh, which is what we call retired priests. And our ministry was to go work at a nursing home. And I was like, we kind of just go from one nursing home to another, uh, our house to this other one. And what I'd really like to do is go serve the poor, be with the actual poor. And Father Scott, who is a wise, wonderful novice master, was like, yes. Uh, And that is about how he said everything. And I said, okay. So we started going. And we went down to a part of Fort Worth that that I bet most of us haven't been to. Uh, It was not a lovely scene. 
um, and honestly, uh, almost immediately overwhelmed me, and I was, I was over my head. But the Franciscan friars were absolutely lovely, and you know, kind of got us into a routine. And every time we got there, they would start to, you know, immediately we'd make oatmeal, and we'd, we'd get food donations, and we'd set them all up. And then the guests, as they called them, would start to come in. And they were, you know, by and large street people. Now, I grew up in rural Mexico, Missouri, a tiny little town in, in, in Missouri where we didn't lock our doors. Uh, literally in high school, I left my keys in the ignition. So I was a bit out of my depth. You know, I was like, okay, I'm in, I'm in a part of a town that my mother, if she'd known existed, would have been like, you are not going to be a priest. If this is the kind of place they're going to send you, you're not going. Um, but it was my idea, you know, so I had, to, I had to buckle up and be like, this is where I'm at. And we had some people that came in who, uh, very honestly, scared me um, to encounter certain types of people, especially when, you know, you've lived an incredibly comfortable and padded life, can shock you. And there was this one guy that would come in pretty regularly, and uh, the Franciscan friars were like, when he comes, just be ready. He's gotten violent a couple times. I'm like, oh, great. You know, this is... This is, this is the kind of service I wanted, um, but it's like I couldn't go tell my novice master, like, I'd rather go back to the nursing home. I was like, you know, I'd, I'd made my bed and I was going to sleep in it. And this guy came in, and he, he was not a very tall man. He was probably only 5'5", five, five, and he had a lot of those, you know, prison tattoos on his face and neck, and was challenging. <laughs> and one day he walked in, and as soon as he walked in the door, he yelled at the top of his lungs, I don't even know who I am. I don't even know who I am. And then immediately he started getting a little aggressive with the other guest, and one of the friars that knew him well came over and put his arm around him and said, let's go sit over here. And and they were, they, you know, always gave everyone that came there the utmost dignity. But that was an unsettling beginning to a day. And I would stand behind the counter and the people would come up table by table and we had an assortment of food and they'd say, I want this, I want that, I want this. And I would put it all on a plate and hand it to them and, you know, try to be the face of Christ and be like, here's your food, here, I'm, I'm doing it, I'm serving the poor, yes. I did this, and uh, the only restrooms in the building were behind me on the left, and uh, we wear our rosaries on the left side. Uh, actually, traditionally, we wear them on the left side because that's the sword side, uh, and so we wear them because for Dominicans, they are the weapon with which we, we, we fight. <laughs> uh, we fight with Our Lady, with our prayer. Anyway, I just like that sidebar. Uh, but my rosary is on my left side, the bathroom is right here, and this guy who's been very aggressive and who I've been warned about walks up to me, and I think he's going to ask to use the bathroom, and he reaches under my scapular, and I'm like, oh, Lord, and he grabs my crucifix and pulls it out, and he looks at it, and he goes, what do you call that thing? And I said, the, 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 you know, like, I was like, hold it together, child of God, you can do this, you asked to be here. And, and I eventually went, it, it's a rosary, it's, it's a way that, that, that we pray to, to the Virgin Mary, it's how we keep track. And then he looks at the crucifix and he goes, and you guys don't call this a cross because Jesus is on it, what do you call that? And I said, it's, it's a crucifix. And then he stared at the crucifix for what, to me, felt like an inordinately long time. It was probably five whole seconds, but he just reached basically under my, under my outfit, and I was like, you know, <laughs> unnerved. And he said, that guy got me through a lot when I was in prison. I had one of those. And then he bent down, and he pressed the crucifix against his head and just held it there. That guy got me through a lot. That was a man who actually knew what suffering was. 
and was able to identify with Jesus on the cross in a way that I think most of us are blessed enough we will never know. Some of us will, and I pray that you pray for me when you're in that position. But he knew what it was like to look at the crucified Lord and not see something terrifying, but see someone who understood him. Because, like I said, I love Jesus. I do. Big fan of his work. <laughs> Devoted my life to him, you know? But normally I'm like, baby Jesus. I love sweet baby Jesus. The incarnation is wonderful, worth reflecting on. You know, I'm a preacher, so when I look at Jesus and his adult life out and preaching among the people, Jesus the healer, I can be with sick people. I can be with other people that are suffering. I can do that. Jesus after he's crucified, the cosmic Christ, you know, contemplating the Christ who was and is and always will be, like I can enter into that mystery, but to stare at the crucifix and to say, I get that, I will admit is very hard for me. To stare at our Lord crucified and to be able to say that guy that moment in Christ's life is the one that I want to hold on to as the one that gets me going is a challenge. Now that man that day blessed me with wisdom that I couldn't have got from any seminary class, that I couldn't have got from anyone else, and he blessed my crucifix. I really do believe that in looking at Jesus and beholding him in front of me, he changed my relationship to my own crucifix that I wear. And after that, I now, when I'm praying, will just hold on to the corpus and put Jesus under my thumb and try to remember that Jesus crucified is the one who actually gets us through a lot. Because if Jesus is not crucified and is not raised, all of this is meaningless that the Paschal mystery is actually the fundamental reality by which we are to view the entire world. Christ crucified is the way that we are to view the world. Now, last night I talked a great deal about suffering and that's what all three nights are about. So, uh, you know, thanks for coming <laughs> for day two of suffering. But I think Suffering is something that we can't deny, you know? We can't actually deny pain. But if we look at Christ crucified, and I wanna spend a little time talking just about the cross and then we'll move to redemptive suffering. But if we look at Christ crucified, I think it's worth reflecting on what's happening there. Because he is at the limit of human suffering. Now, there is, of course, the physical suffering, right? Certainly there is the physical suffering of being tortured and then lifted up on the cross. But then there also has to be an incredible amount of emotional and psychological suffering. That Jesus, who has been surrounded by throngs of people who love him, <laughs> who is surrounded by people that hang on his every word, who has just recently fed crowds of thousands, who has lifted up others from the dead, Jesus who has been told that he is loved and adored and treasured by 12 men who fundamentally misunderstand him through all of scripture, which gives us all hope. Um, <laughs> all, all, of, all of the apostles normally get it wrong and I'm like, thank you, because uh, that gives me room to get it wrong and to keep growing but they still walked with him all the way until Palm Sunday. And they're with him on Holy Thursday, but then they cannot stay awake with him through the night, and he is left abandoned. The emotional and psychological suffering of being alone is one of the things that I think all of us can relate to. Again, when I was a novice, it was my, my first Christmas without my family. And when you do your first Christmas away from everyone else, I think married couples probably go through this too, uh, don't they just do it wrong? Like, <laughs> like when you celebrate Christmas with another group of people, you're like, this is the wrong food. 
Um, you didn't make it right. You obviously don't know what we're supposed to drink. Uh, you know, uh, you're opening the presents at a really ridiculous time. And then normally this is when we get up, just every step of it, you're like, you fundamentally misunderstand it. And so my first Christmas in the novitiate, I felt terribly alone. I felt so alone. And I was just like, nobody here actually gets what it is to, to celebrate Christmas. And two people that day really helped me. It was Christmas, and so even though it wasn't a Saturday, I was allowed to call home. We were only allowed to call home on Saturdays. And I called my mom, and uh, my, my mom is a, a nurse, which is one of the reasons I think I'm like I am in many good ways and bad. Um, but my mother is a nurse, and so she'd had to work the entire night shift the night before. And then my dad is actually an engineer, and there was an issue at the factory, so he was gone on Christmas Day, and he wasn't going to get home until mid-afternoon. And I called my mom in the morning, and I was like, how are you, Mom? And I was waiting for her to be my source of joy, and she's like, I'm really lonely. I was like, you've been married for 45 years. <laughs> and she was like, well, he's not here right now and my kids aren't here. And she was like, and she said, you know, it doesn't matter how long you live together. Sometimes you're just really lonely. But that experience of loneliness permeates every relationship. I honestly think that one of the reasons we have loneliness is because only God can fulfill that. <laughs> that one of the reasons we all actually have that seed of loneliness is, is not that it's bad, but instead it's actually just another sign that only God can fulfill us. That again, you have that you know, beginning of your relationship, the sun rises and sets in their eyes. Uh, but then eventually you're like, mm, I'm kind of lonely and I really wish you would put his shoes away. Uh, you know, you're kinda, you, you get to that next step. And a little later in that day, um, I was doing dishes, uh, and they were doing them wrong. You know, uh, again, <laughs> everything was wrong that Christmas. Uh, and Father Don Dvorak, God rest his soul, uh, he was a chaplain at UD for 10 years, and at the time uh, was just about to be 80. He died uh, last year, uh, good, holy friar. Uh, but he said to me that night, <laughs> on Christmas night, he said, how are you? He was a very gruff man. He came up, we always called him the curmudgeon of curmudgeons. Um, but he was really he was sweet underneath it all. And he said, how are you? And I was like, honestly, I'm, I'm sad and I'm lonely. And he looked at me and he said, holidays will always be different once you're a priest. It's one of the things that we put on the cross for the people of God. And wow. Does that change your perspective? I'm like, oh, this is something that I can put on the cross. This is a, this loneliness, this struggle, silly and small as it is, the fact that they didn't make cinnamon rolls in the morning, which you're supposed to, because that's what my dad does and it's very important. <laughs> but just because that wasn't done and I had a, a ting of loneliness, a longing for home that couldn't be fulfilled where I was, even something that small we can give to God. But to get back to Jesus on the cross, I think there's one more element of pain that Jesus has that brings him to the limit of his suffering, that brings him to the limit of human suffering. And I think that last one is existential pain. Now, Theologians, much more brilliant than I will ever be, have taken apart what we prayed with last night again and again and again. But the fact that Jesus quotes Psalm 22 from the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Declares a moment where if Jesus, we know, is not actually separated from God the Father, and taking on all of our sin, I think understands our own loss of meaning. Isn't that when we're the most in pain? Isn't that when we suffer the most? Is when we've lost meaning, when we've lost purpose, 
when we don't know what's happening or why, when we don't know the direction to go, when we are a ship in the middle of the sea and we can't see land, isn't that the moment when we feel really the worst, that existential pain? And so Jesus experiences these three very different pains, the physical and then the emotional, psychological, and the existential on the cross, which is one of the reasons that when we have any of those pains, we can give it to him and offer it with him. Now, I mentioned that he might have had that existential moment on the cross where he declares, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Because of sin. And the connection between pain and sin is quite real. First of all, if we're really honest, when we're in pain, we don't normally act that good. Um, I mean, I, I will admit that quite honestly, that, that it is rare that I am in a suffering place and someone comes over and I'm like, oh my gosh, let me get you some coffee. You know, normally I'm like, hi. You know, and that's if I'm being really good. And if I'm in any physical pain, I'm like, you should be here to comfort me. You know, that, that pain immediately in some way makes us needy. But I think also the pain that I'm in can lead me to lash out at others and hurt others. I think uh, I've heard this phrase a lot and I think it's true. Hurt people hurt people. That people who are normally the most wounded are the ones that seem to lash out the most quickly. Uh, someday, maybe you can be with me when I talk about healing. I think <laughs> the interior healing journey is one of the most important things any Christian can do. That if we're not working on healing, we'll fall to sin again and again. Now, Father Rock, who died this year, uh, Cistercian was my first spiritual director when I moved here. Uh, and for a while, I was a little scared of him because everything I said that wasn't good, he'd go, terrible, terrible. Uh, that was just because he was Hungarian. Uh, apparently, that's just how he relaxed, reacted to most things. Uh, but I was always like, is it that bad? Uh, I was like, I thought these were fairly normal problems. But one time, he talked to me about sin in a way that also changed how I thought about sin forever. He said that sin is when we ask God not to exist for a moment. That sin is when we ask God not to exist for a moment. Lord, I don't want you to see what I'm about to do. Lord, I don't want you to see this really selfish choice I'm about to make. I don't want you to see this indulgence, this pride, this vanity, this lust, this gossip. This moment, Lord, is just for me and my temporal pleasure. And if you could just not exist and look away for a moment so that me and my sin can have a moment alone. And don't we get into that kind of cycle of sin? Anyone that's struggled with habitual sin, anyone that's had a problem where they really have had to root it out, that sin becomes familiar. That sin becomes familial. That we actually learn how to be more comfortable with that sin. And what becomes the most awful is when we identify with it. When we begin to say, that's just who I am. You know, it's the, the, the person who comes up and goes, well, I'm just a gossip. Or I'm just someone, I'm just, you know, I'm, I just, I'm an alcoholic. I'm just someone who struggles with lust. Uh, that's just who I am. No, you're not. <laughs> you are sons and daughters of God with all the freedom that that entails. And that God wants you to be free of those sins because sin keeps us from being present to God in every moment. When we sin, we ask God not to exist for a moment. And what could be more painful than being separated from our beloved? That the one who loves us, the one who breathes into us, the one that gives us life and mercy and joy, what is more painful than being separated from him? God, who experiences the limit of physical, emotional, psychological, and even existential pain shows us something powerful on the cross, doesn't he? That God's mercy is greater than the totality of human pain. 
that whatever sin we've committed, whatever pain we've endured, whether it is of our own doing or whether it's something that has just befallen us, whatever suffering we've had, whatever sin we've encountered, whatever rejection we've had, that the totality of that is less than God's triumphant mercy. That's amazing. <laughs> That's life-changing. Last night I talked about how the crucifixion shows us God's superabundance. That mercy is so much greater than just the wages of sin. All this pain, all this suffering, like I said, has to have a meaning. And if Jesus takes on the fullness of the human condition in the incarnation, which he does, he brings it to fulfillment in his crucifixion and resurrection. This pain, the suffering gives meaning. The love consenting to this pain makes it salvific. Saint Irenaeus, very early, early Catholic saint, uh, actually talks about this in what we call recapitulation. Uh, this is a good fancy theological word, but largely the way to understand it is that everything Jesus does is an act of redemption. So when Jesus is conceived, he redeems conception. When Jesus is born, he redeems birth. When Jesus walks and talks, when Jesus does anything in being human, he then brings that to the fullness of redemption. So when Jesus dies, he redeems even death. He vanquishes death. And that's beautiful. But I think still, when we forget about the crucifix, I think we can forget the most important part of our faith. Now, I'm a, a young priest and I, I will admit that I do love incense. And every Sunday I circle the altar twice and I have to tell you that when I look up at the cross, I normally give it a rather furtive glance. Part of it is because I think offering <laughs> the king of all creation a little bit of incense, I'm like, thank you. <laughs> you know, I feel like what a silly little gift I'm offering. But also because when I recognize who Jesus really is and what he did for me, I think I'm a little ashamed. Because the Lord has made all things, right? And he's made all things gifts. Our breathing, moving bodies, our creative and thinking brains, our ability to love and hope and dream, every relationship, and then we often reject it. We reject the incredible gifts that God has given us, and then we offer a little bit of incense and go about our day. And in that rejection, the Lord still, in spite of us, or I'd like to think because of us, offers every bit of his life on the cross. That we reject the beauty of being human, we reject the gift of love that is offered at every turn, and here I stand, a broken sinner, a foolish young priest, thrice incensing the doorway to salvation, and I'm humbled. I'm shocked. The question I have for you tonight is where do you stand in relationship to the cross? That when we prayed through the passion tonight, if you imagined it, where did you stand? Where were you in relationship to Jesus on the cross? Because during this mission, I'm not asking you to give a furtive glance, not to offer just a bit of incense or a quick prayer but instead to tread carefully up to the beauty and the horror of the cross and deeply contemplate it. That's what Lent is about, that we look to the crucifix, yes, as sin, but more importantly, as hope and mercy. Because in looking at the cross, it's okay to see our own brokenness, our loneliness, our desperation, and yes, brothers and sisters, certainly our sin. Our sin, both private and corporate, all of humanity's sins. It's okay to see our foibles and failures, to see our sickness, to see our dreams crushed. 
we see how often we dehumanize our own brothers and sisters made in that same image of God, who when we look at Christ, is hung. We are to stare into the cross and see all the darkness of this world. That's true. But if all we see is darkness when we look at the cross, then we failed. Because in looking at the cross, we are asked to confront our sin. But not because God wants us to feel terrible. It's not called Terrible Friday. It's not called Awful Friday. It's not called Self-Pity Friday. It's not called What a Worm Garbage Person I Am Friday. It's Good Friday. And the reason that is, is because we are also given another gift. Besides seeing that our sin actually is rejecting our beloved, we can actually then put our loneliness, our darkness, our desperation, all of it on the cross. And the Lord willingly and lovingly accepts it. My offering, O God, is a broken spirit. To return back to that psalm, my offering is a broken spirit. That we can set our broken spirit on the altar when we come to enter the sacrifice once and for all again. And every time we sin, the Lord is ready for us to bring it to him again. And he's ready to pour himself out again. Not only does he take it, but in doing so, I think he actually asks us to stand in the place, if we read the Gospel of John, tonight we read Matthew, but in the Gospel of John, I think he asks us to stand in the place of the beloved disciple, to stand right there in front of him. And I think the reason the beloved disciple is never given a name is so that we can stand right there. We are offered the position to believe to be the beloved disciple. We can stand in that place, and at first, yes, maybe offer only a furtive and humbled and even scared glance at the cross. But when we stand in the place of the beloved disciple, we know that we are already beloved. When we stand in the place of the beloved disciple, we know that we are loved. Brothers and sisters, the cross is the doorway to the family of God. The cross is the doorway to the family of God. We are no longer slaves to our sins and sadness, but we're friends, brothers and sisters to Christ crucified. And the Lord looks at each and every one of us today and every day and then gives us the additional gift of his mother. Behold your mother in the Gospel of John. While our Lord is dying, he goes, and here is yet another gift. I have poured myself out to you, but now I want you to be part of the Holy Family. I want my mother to be yours so that she can mother you and love you and pray for you and intercede for you. We've been given a universal fraternity. We've been given all of brotherhood with Christ as our first brother. We've been given the mother of God, Mary most holy to intercede for us to walk with us in sin and failure, to walk with us in sickness. We've been given a seat at the table of the family of God if we can walk through the doorway of the cross. You and I are called as we walk towards Good Friday to prepare ourselves to reverence the cross. But before we do that, let's grab our fear, our doubt, our sins, all those things that make us not beloved, all those things that make us say, I don't want God to exist for a moment, let's take all of those things and hand them over to Christ. Set them at the foot of the cross. Tell the Lord that you want your burdens lifted, that you want to see life, that you want to preach the gospel. Tell the Lord that you want to be alive again in your faith and that you want to walk through the doorway of the cross. Brothers and sisters, I've only been a priest for three years, but I work at a college campus, and I am in the confessional three or four hours a week. And I'm gonna be honest, that can be hard. 
can actually be very hard sometimes to see the depth of pain that people have, to know that I can't give them the consolation that they want, and also to hear how incredibly hard people are on themselves. I actually believe, maybe this makes me crazy, that the Lord normally has a lower standard for us than we have for ourselves. The Lord actually just wants us to love him and to offer our brokenness and to try to step away from sin. And most of us are normally like, I think what the Lord wants is three rosaries and he wants me to never ever have an upset feeling and he wants me to stay really hydrated and he wants me to make sure that I go to, to go to exercise twice a day at least. You know, like we have this standard that somehow Jesus is not calling us to. Instead, Jesus is calling us into a relationship to love him, to be with him. But in order to enter that relationship in its fullness, we do have to walk through the doorway of the cross, not to celebrate death, not to stand in sin, but instead to celebrate the vanquishing of death and sin, to celebrate the life that we receive poured out from the cross. That Jesus on the cross, when the blood and water leave his side, gives us the first and fullest taste of the Eucharist that we are able to take that water and wine and enter into the fullness of his life. We need to stand in a new way, in a new relationship to the cross. For the wage of sin is death, we know that, but the love of Christ is stronger than death. His suffering gives our suffering meaning. We adore the cross, we do, we reverence the cross, for we know that our Lord has cleansed the world of all errors, banished disease, driven out hunger, unlocked prisons, and loosened fetters. The cross gives health to the sick and salvation to the dying. That's what the cross does. And the Lord offers us part of that cross. And I think that scares us. None of us really want part of the cross, do we? I know that again, to return to that first story that I shared, Lord, teach me everything about the cross. Do I want to know everything about the cross? Now, John Vianney, another great saint, actually wrote a sustained reflection on the crucifix, another thing that I'd commend to your Lenten reading. If you stick with me long enough, I'll be like, here's 400 books that you should read by the end of this Lent. Um, it's one of the ways I'm annoyingly Dominican. Uh, we are always reading at least two to three books, and lots of times we don't finish them, but we say they changed our lives. Uh, but John Vianney has this beautiful, sustained re uh, reflection on the cross. So I'm gonna quote him in length here because he says it better than I ever could. Whether we will it or not, we must suffer. There are some who suffer like the good thief and others like the bad thief. They both suffered equally, but one knew how to make his sufferings meritorious. He accepted them in the spirit of reparation and turning towards Jesus crucified, he received from his mouth these beautiful words, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. On the way to the cross you see, my children, only the first step is painful. I'm gonna repeat that. On the way to the cross you see, my children, only the first step is painful. Our greatest cross is the fear of crosses. We have not the courage to carry our cross. We are very much mistaken for whatever we do, the cross holds us tight. We cannot escape from it. What then have we to lose? Why not love our crosses? and make use of them to take us to heaven. Our greatest fear, according to John Vianney, is fear of our crosses. But when we embrace them, we can be like the good thief who sees Jesus in paradise that day. So how do we unite our suffering to the cross? 
not just some theological abstraction, not just pious silliness, but instead, how do we actually take our pain, our suffering, and actually hand it over to Jesus? We have to learn to lean into it. Now, we don't want to lean into it too far. Uh, and I say that because uh, I work with young, incredibly zealous people, and what I don't want us to do is to kind of enter into a masochism. The Lord does not want you to hurt. The Lord's desire for you is not to suffer. So don't add suffering. If you're already having a bad time, you don't need to then, you know, be like, oh, Lord, I'm doing so bad. Please help me do worse so that I can see your... No, that's not what Jesus wants. Uh, stop that. It's ridiculous. If you're suffering from loneliness, you don't have to lock yourself at home to really lean into it. Uh, you can feel lonely and go to Starbucks. You know, you can, you can get out of the house. You don't have to just stay with that feeling. But when we have those feelings, when we have that suffering, the other thing that we don't want to do is turn it into some kind of scrupulosity. Is my pain enough? Is this, is this enough of a thing? I probably should offer this to Jesus. I wouldn't want to bother the Lord. You know, he's so busy. It is a Sunday. You know, that's his busiest day. Uh, you know, so today I'll leave him alone. No, we don't want to get into some weird scrupulosity where, where we think we can somehow bother or bug or burden the Lord. Uh, get over it. <laughs> Lean into that pain. Jesus doesn't carry the cross reluctantly. Jesus doesn't carry the cross reluctantly, so neither should we. When we're offered a cross, we can lament about it. We can be like Job. We can be like the psalmist and say, this is really, really hard, Lord. But then we take that pain and we offer it to someone else. We offer it to something else. The suffering were offered, if anyone should follow me, he must take up his cross daily. I wish Jesus would have said he must, you know, take up daily mass. He must take up a rosary. He must take up a, you know, one of the shorter devotionals, you know, not, not the long one, but the nice short one. That's the one. But Jesus says, no, you must take up your cross daily. No easy thing to do. We can't allow ourselves to be too busy to see the cross as God offers us. One of the things I think we do is we mire ourselves in projects and busyness and distraction. We figure out what can we do to numb any of the pain that I'm having because I don't want to actually have to deal with the cross that's being offered me. But instead, when that pain actually does come up, to instead turn it to the Lord and see it as salvific. In fact, declaring the power of salvific suffering, the Apostle Paul says, in my flesh I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. In my flesh I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, the church. Now, that's actually part of the, the collect, the opening prayer for the exaltation of the cross. And one of my uh, brother priests, uh, who I won't name, we'll call him Father. Uh, but he, uh, <laughs> he sent a message to our group chat and he was like, Doesn't, didn't today's opening prayer sound kind of heretical? And one of our other brothers went, it's from Colossians. <laughs> like, <laughs> but I think he hit on something true, right? When we hear that, what is lacking in Christ's afflictions? To go back to what I said at the beginning, he's at the limit of human suffering, right? The physical, the emotional, the psychological, even the existential. What could be missing in Christ's afflictions? We can see that Jesus didn't come to take away our suffering, right? In this world, he says that we'll have suffering. He says that we need to take heart. He says that he has overcome the world. Instead, Jesus, when we suffer, gives our suffering meaning. I keep repeating it, but Jesus gives our suffering meaning. John Paul II, in his encyclical about redemptive suffering, points out that there is nothing missing in Jesus' suffering on the cross. 
that we're not going to somehow complete it. Jesus didn't leave salvation unfinished for us to do, that we don't have to just suffer just enough to open the doorway to heaven. Instead, JP2 says this, in the cross of Christ, not only is the redemption accomplished through suffering, but also human suffering itself has been redeemed that it not only accomplishes it through suffering, but it redeems suffering itself. Christ, without any fault of his own, took on himself the total evil of sin, and the experience of this evil determined the incomparable extent of Christ's suffering, which became the price of redemption. Jesus will go as far as he needs to to save us. If we believe the creed we say every Sunday, Jesus literally will descend to hell to redeem us and set us free. And now he invites us into suffering, not into more suffering. That's not what I'm saying again. Let's not add to it. Life's hard enough. But instead, he invites us more deeply into our suffering. So that with St. Paul, we can say, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. What is lacking? Nothing. But JP2 says there's nothing more to be offered. Again, Jesus is super abundant. But so that you and I can in some way participate in the redemption of the world, Christ extends to us a sliver of the cross so that we can in some way be co-workers with him. Christ extends us a sliver, a particle, the smallest part of the cross, so that our suffering and our pain can in some way add to the redemption of the world. JP2 goes on, and now I'm going to quote him at length, but if you're mad at me for quoting JP2, I am not sorry. Uh, God bless that man. Those who share in Christ's sufferings have before their eyes the paschal mystery of the cross and the resurrection in which Christ descends in a first phase to the ultimate limits of human weakness and impotence. Indeed, he dies nailed to the cross. But if at the same time in this weakness there is accomplished his lifting up, confirmed by the power of the resurrection, then this means that the weaknesses of all human sufferings are capable of being infused with the same power of God manifested in Christ's cross. The weaknesses of all human sufferings are capable of being infused with the same power of God manifested in Christ's cross. And such a concept, to suffer, means to become more susceptible, more open to the working of the salvific powers of God offered to humanity in Christ. And so when we feel awful, downtrodden, when we feel sick, when we feel lonely, when we ache, when we hurt, when we struggle, when we struggle with others, when we see our friends' and family's pains, Jesus can take that suffering even the foolish suffering of being upset that there were no cinnamon rolls on Christmas morning, and transform it into something redemptive for the world. Our sliver of the cross can change the world. When we accept our suffering, first, yes, like Job, we lament, but then when we accept our suffering, we can use it to bring others to holiness. My grandmother was... Uh, unusually hardcore. Uh, A good woman, a great woman, a saintly woman, uh, but we always joked like our grandma wasn't like other grandmas, like my grandma did not cook. Uh, I never learned anything about I love baking and cooking and people are like, who'd you learn from? And I'm always like, YouTube. Uh, Because my my grandmother was a full-time nurse, my mother was a full-time nurse. They were not kneading the dough. They weren't at home working on 12-hour stews. We were a hamburger helper kind of family. And when my grandma was towards the end of her life, especially, she would just, she loved her grandchildren, and so she would order pizza and call it Grandma's Home Cooking. Uh, and she'd be like, Grandma's Home Cooking is here, and it'd be Domino's, and I'm like, yes. Uh, But what I'll say is that when my grandma got sicker and sicker, she really, she had terrible arthritis. um, And and her bones became brittle enough they would just break. uh, And they weren't able to really, she couldn't move from the chair to the bed without weeping at the end of her life. 
And in her room, she had a statue of the sacred heart of Jesus. And in her room, what she would do is she would take whoever in the family was having the hardest time, who she thought was struggling the most. We'd actually joke that, <laughs> that whoever was under was normally the one that grandma was like, you're doing real bad. Um, and she would put their picture at the base of the statue, right under the sacred heart. And I asked her, Grandma, because she would always tell us to offer it up, and I asked her once, I was like, Grandma, what does that actually look like? And she said, whenever I begin to weep because I'm in so much pain, I say to my Lord, use this so that my grandchildren will go to heaven. Use this so that my grandchildren will go to heaven. Now, I will tell you, I spent a lot of time directly at the base of that statue. <laughs> I spent so many years. Uh, if it was a competition, I won. Uh, my cousin Andy had a few years, but uh, overall, I really, no competition. And I have to say that I believe, really and truly, that my grandma's constant prayer for me through her pain and struggling is the reason that God wouldn't leave me alone and called me to the priesthood that my grandma's constant struggle and pain at the end of her life was something that allowed me to say that whatever is happening, I can do it. <laughs> that my life is, is roses comparatively. Now my grandma died before I got ordained, but she did get to see me in the habit. And one of the most beautiful moments of my life is towards, it was very hard, like I said, to get her out, but. I came back and she was like, I want to go to Sunday Mass. And my mom was like, you're not going to Sunday Mass. You can watch it on TV. And my grandma was like, I'm going to Mass. Uh, and once grandma was set, she was set. And so then when we got there, she asked me if I would push her up to receive the Eucharist. And my uncle Rick was the extraordinary minister of communion. And I got to take my grandma up to Jesus. I got to push my grandma who had pushed me with her prayers and her pain and her suffering. I got to push my grandma up to receive the Lord from her own son, my uncle Rick, another good and holy man. That's what transformative pain looks like. That it doesn't end in something worse and harsh and awful. It ends in joy. It doesn't end in something that makes us bitter or cold or somehow separated from the Lord, but it ends in joy. I cherish the fact that I got to do that for my grandmother. And I know that that was an incredibly hard day for her, but I know that she wanted to be there and I know that I got the chance to push her up there. So the invitation I offer to you tonight, that I offer to you this Lent, is to take whatever suffering you have and lament first, but then to set it on the cross and to say, let this weakness have power. To say, let this emptiness be full. To say, let this loneliness be yours, Lord, and offer it for the things that you know your friends and family need. No easy invitation, one I'm working on hard. But let us offer our suffering together to the cross, walk through that doorway, and watch it become joy. Thank you. I'd like us to just stand up and turn towards Our Lady, and we'll sing the Salve Regina together, and then uh, I will head out to the lobby, and if you have anything you want to ask me or bug me about, you are more than welcome to. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulce Do, Et Spes Nostra Salve. Ante clamamus, exules filii heve, ante suspiramus, gementes et flentes, in hac lacrimarum vale. 
Ea ergo advocata nostra, illos tuos misericordes oculos, ad nos converte. Et Jesum benedictum fructum ventris tui, nobis post hoc exilium ostende. O clemens, O pia, O dulcis virgo Maria. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.